Hello again, everyone. <laughs> Welcome to the second session of the metadata production track, Implementing BitFrame Record Creation, a Strategy. My name is TJ Kao. I'm the head of metadata creation at the University of California, Davis. My co-facilitator, Michelle Futonik, is the LD4P program manager at Stanford University. Our presenter for this session is Mary Singh. Mary is the acquisitions lead librarian at the Freak Art Reference Librarian. She served as the primary investigator for the Freak for the second phase of the LD4P Mellon funded grant to explore implementation of BigFrame. She currently is serving as co-chair of the PCC test group charged with collecting information from current LD4P cohort members in order to create the best practices and training for the big friend software, Sinopia. Before I turn the mic to Mary, I would like to go through a few things. Please use the Q&A function to submit your questions or comments during the presentation. Mary will answer questions after her presentation. You can also use chat to share thoughts with other attendees. To enhance your conference experience, just in case you haven't done so, we would also like to encourage you to continue the conversation through Slack and Twitter and check out recordings from other sessions at the 2020 LD4 Conference YouTube channel. Without further ado, here's Mary. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll start this presentation now. Uh, I'm Mary Seam. I'm the Acquisitions Lead Librarian at the Frick Art Reference Library. Um, just before we get started, I want to make sure everyone can see the presentation the screen. You can hear me. Everything is good. Looks good and sounds good. Okay, great. So um, despite being the lead acquisitions librarian um, and not having a lot of experience, Beyond cataloging with linked data, I became the Frick's primary investigator for the LD4P grant, the second phase. Um, the Frick has sort of always prided itself on being at the forefront of a lot of uh, technology and these sorts of initiatives, uh, despite its size. And uh, while that can be difficult because we don't have as many people, it does make us fairly nimble. And so I was hoping to use this presentation as an opportunity to show how BibFrame can be implemented at a much smaller library. So a quick overview first. Um, the first phase happened over two years ago and uh, was mostly focused on uh, five libraries that were focusing on developing ontologies that catered to their different collections and holdings. Um, you can see Columbia, Harvard, Cornell, Princeton, Stanford. Um, and then the second phase, which just ended at the end of June, um, was called Pathways to Implementation, and it was more focused on libraries creating the profiles to describe their unique holdings and also to test and develop uh, the, so the software to perform record creation, which is called Synopia. Um, and then there's also work to expand um, links between authorities and vocabularies to perform record creation in Synopia. And so these are some of the main goals of the second phase. Um, I will say of them, the only one that doesn't seem to have been fully achieved was the um, mark to bid frame, bid frame to mark conversion. But there is a third phase of the grant, which is already un underway or about to begin. Um, and so hopefully that's something that will be addressed in addition to further developing the software and um, sort of increasing the number of institutions that can participate in Synopia. Um, so of these goals, this presentation is sort of more focused on the profile creation and testing and the best practices and workflows. Um, and then the Frick specifically, what we were interested in doing for this grant was increasing our workflow um, and creating the workflows for the grant, but then also to create profiles that reflected our unique holdings. So we created a monographs and exhibition catalogs profile, which initially had only planned to be for monographs, but we realized that exhibition catalogs require an extra event template added to recognize the exhibition history that's associated with the catalog. Um, we made profiles for the contemporary and historic auction catalogs. And again, those are different because historic auction catalogs often have a rare books component. So there were some aspects of 
uh, rare materials ontology that we had to incorporate. Uh, the web archives profile was des designed to uh, describe a lot of our holdings. We have a very robust web archiving program and um, it's very interesting and different from the other profiles in that uh, we have to account for both an, uh, an archived site that's been archived for the program and also a live site if possible. And so we had to create some sort of workarounds within the profiles that would address when you need to have two instances like that. And then the last one is the artist files profile, um, which we use to describe the artist file names within our photo archive. Um, and this was an especially interesting one because we uh, are beginning to rely on Wikidata as an alternative source for uh, description information. The Frick has about 44,000 names in its artist files, um, many of which about half are not described in Wikidata, nor can they be found in ULAN or VIA or LC. So we've been working slowly but surely to add all of those names to Wikidata so that we can use that as a source for describing material. Um, and like I said, a large part of this project was to develop the workflows and policies that we implemented at the Frick. And so to go through sort of the beginning of how we created our profiles, we created them institutionally with a lot of help and input from some of the affinity groups as part of the grant. Um, this is an example of one of the profiles in progress. And this spreadsheet was made by Ryan Mendenhall at Columbia, who was helping us a bit. Um, his just looks nicer than the ones that I made, so I thought it would be a good example. Um, so what we did was we took sample mark records of the materials that we wanted to describe, and then we expanded all of the mark fields and tags that we thought we would need. Um, and you can see them on the left. We sort of expanded all of them. And then we went through and identified which of these fields were belong to the work instance item or to an administrative metadata uh, resource template. And then color coded those just to make it easier to separate and parse out the different aspects of the profile. And then we went through and mapped all of the different values as they appear in BibFrame. And this made creating the profiles really easy because we had all of the fields we wanted and all of the BibFrame elements that we wanted. We could just go and take the work resource template and add all of the properties and do the same for the instance and the item. Um, this ensured that we didn't miss any of the fields that we wanted to include. And I feel like this made for a very streamlined method. Um, I don't think we're the only ones I remember hearing. Um, I think the National Library of Medicine doing something similar. It's, it seems to be a very popular way to create a profile just because it makes sure that nothing is, uh, nothing is left out. So once we created the profile, um, I then made a user guide for each of the profiles and I also made a user guide for Synopia itself, the software. You can see that on the bottom left. This is just a screenshot of some of our documentation. Um, and then to show you the Synopia user guide, this is just the title page with the table of contents. It went through the entire process of using Synopia from beginning to end. So you can see um, all of the different uh, the topics that it addresses. Um, like this, it shows how to create an account and to open a new record with screenshots. Um, I tried to make it as complete as possible so that anybody who had never used it before that we were training really had answers to every aspect of the process um, available to them. We also showed how to use the profile, how to save a record, how to reopen a record to edit it. Um, and then also it went through and described some of the vocabulary and the various fields that you would encounter in a profile. I also made uh, user guides for every profile in addition to just Synopia. Um, this is the one for the monograph and exhibition catalog. You can see um, that we have the descriptions for each of the properties and they're parsed out into work instance item and then that event Bit, which is the extra one that you need to fill in, in addition to the work instance and item of a monograph, if it's an exhibition catalog and has exhibition history associated with it. Um, it shows how and where to find the profile. So I know this is really blurry, it's blurry for me, but it's just a screenshot of our documentation. Um, but it explains where to find the correct profile to begin working from so that there's no question. And 
as Sanofia changed and updated, I went back and updated all of these screenshots so that it accurately reflected what the user could expect to see as they were going through Sanofia. And then you can see this is an example of some of the ways that I described properties. So there are notes to help guide users, things like you don't need to fill in every property if there's an information available, but then also going property by property, identifying um, if it's a lookup or what the, um, the field searches against, just to give people a better idea so that they knew everything about the properties as they were working from them. Um, you'll see in, in a few slides from now, but sometimes in these descriptions, we did refer to the corresponding mark field as a guide. And um, while I recognize that's not ideal, uh, because we're really trying to make this a distinct effort from cataloging using Mark. Um, it was just very helpful for um, our, our staff. And also sometimes there were sort of lengthy descriptions, use policies and stuff that were in the Mark fields that it was just sort of easier to refer to for copying and pasting. Um, and then here's an example of the web archiving guide. You can see that there's the distinction between the work the instance for the live site, the instance for the archive site, and the item. And uh, these types of distinctions are really helpful, I think. In fact, this was an example of a time where um, when I had created the user guide, I had put all of the properties in the instance together and then said next to them whether they belonged to a live site description or an archive site description. And it was suggested by the people who were performing the cataloging that it was easier to split it into a description for the live site and a description for the archive site um, so that they didn't have to bounce back and forth. Um, and I think that it's a great example of sort of just how there was easy collaboration and that the users helped to inform um, the best layout for them for how to use uh, the user guides. And again, this shows some of the properties, whether they're a lookup, a literal, if they point to a resource, what resource they point to, what happens if something doesn't work the way you want it. And you can see under the copyright, it says based on the Mark 506 field. So that again was giving um, guidance. A lot of, um, it's actually all of the cataloging we did was not original cataloging in BibFrame. It was deriving from pre-existing Mark records. And so they would have, the user would have a, a Mark record to work from with that 506 field in front of them. And so once those profiles were created and the training guides or the user guides were created, we got into some staff training. Uh, overall, we trained 14 people and we divided them into training groups based on the materials they were most comfortable working with in their normal day-to-day -day jobs. So those who were experienced with cataloging monographs uh, or, or who performed acquisitions um, with print materials, would be trained on monographs. Those who had experience with web archives would do web archives. I should add that um, not every staff member was a trained cataloger. In fact, very few were. Um, so a lot of people came to it with sort of a fresh uh, look, which was very helpful in a way because the differences between Mark and BibFrame are substantial. And um, sometimes it's helpful not to be mired down in sort of the, uh, the pre-established thoughts about Mark when thinking about how to use BibFrame. So um, the training, what they were divided, these people were divided into these groups based on the profiles they'd be working with. And the training sessions were about two hours where I would show them through Synopia, essentially walking through the entirety of the Synopia user guide and would show them step-by-step -step how to open Synopia, create their account, how to find the profile they'd be using, how to save, how to edit. Um, and then we do a walkthrough where I would enter a sample record in Synopia for that profile that they were using. And then each person would go around and take turns entering and creating their own profile. And I found this to be time consuming, but really helpful because it gave everybody a chance to try record creation while I was with them. Everybody got to watch other records get made. And then it also gave a chance to sort of do some troubleshooting and uh, tweaking to the user guides like as we were doing the actual training, um, it seemed to be pretty effective. Uh, and there were a few people who did ask to attend multiple sessions just to sort of get a handle on it. They would go and watch, um, sit in on the training for a different profile that they weren't working with, but it just was sort of a refresher. Um, but it was never more than seven people at once. Um, but I do recognize that it did take quite a bit of time per person. 
And so once people were trained, all of the information that I wanted them to have, I housed on a Google Drive. So this housed the place where they would put documentation, uh, also the mark record lists that they would work from, and then also the user guides. Um, and to sort of, I can show you the user guides one more time, they were all housed together um, and, and they were accessible to everybody who was training. So if they were interested in looking at something else that was totally available. Um, I also created lists of potential records for people to work from. So different groups of people worked with different sets of records and we identified lists of available records that they could work from and put them in this list. And then um, in the list, they would indicate the date, uh, the bib record of that title or whatever material they were working from and they would leave their initials next to it. And that was in part for people to sort of claim the records that they wanted to work from and also to make sure that there was no duplication of effort because you didn't want people to be cataloging the same thing multiple times. Um, although that was, we were able to catch that again in our, um, in our documentation. And so this is the sort of main documentation center that we created. Um, we parsed it out based on the different profiles. You can see across the bottom, we had different tabs for the different profiles. And here, the user would put the date that they created the profile, their initial, the bib number of the mark record they were working from, the URL generated in Synopia after they created their record, um, whether it was an original record creation or a derived. And you can see, and as was the case for every record that was made, they were all um, derived from pre-existing mark records. And then they also had a space to leave any notes or questions. Um, they were also able to use this sort of as a holding area. So um, when using Synopia, if you wish to make changes to your record that you've been working on, you can re-enter that Synopia URL and it will pull up the record for you to edit again. So often people would sort of park a record in progress here just to make sure that nothing was lost along the way. Um, and so we did use this not only to keep track of the records that people had created, but also um, to periodically sort of do some spot checking of the records. Um, I found it especially likely um, with some of those exhibition catalogs, for example, where there was that extra event template that they had to add on top of the normal monograph description, that sometimes that was forgotten. So it was just an opportunity for us to go back and make sure that things were working. Um, one thing that was very common and is a bit buggy with Synopia at the time was that um, the lookups towards um, things like the Library of Congress subject headings or some geographic names uh, could be quite buggy. And so um, often people would leave a question in the notes saying, you know, the lookups weren't working the way I wanted and I couldn't find what I wanted. And so we could later go back and make those changes or see if it would improve at a different point. Um, and here's another look at one for the exhibition catalog. So you can see like there are questions people have about series numbering or they'll put other concerns. Um, and then the last tab on that uh, documentation was sort of weekly statistics. So I gathered weekly statistics on who had been cataloging what and sort of keeping just some general notes about the process. You can see um, where people's initials have gray next to them. That was the like sort of slow phasing in of people as they were being trained for record creation. Um, and then in addition to keeping track of all of this, um, we also had a larger space left for people to leave notes. Um, this was sort of in addition to that small notes section next to each record that they created, if there were sort of larger issues um, for people to ask that was, this was a place to do it. And this informed a lot of the questions that I brought forward to the affinity groups as a part of the grant, um, or that I asked the grant Slack channel. Um, it was a lot of stuff relating to things like series numbering or the differences in the way that publishing information is described in Synopia versus Mark. And again, um, lots of questions about the lookups and the difficulties finding the geographic name they wanted to accurately describe their resource and stuff like that. So this was really helpful because not only to inform um, questions that I should ask, but also in how to tweak documentation or how to think about um, the work that the Frick had done overall and potentially make changes to some of our profiles.
And so overall, um, the grant, I think, or our involvement in the grant was especially successful. We um, created the profiles that we wanted. We were able to train um, the staff we wanted. Everybody seemed to be actively involved in the work that they were doing and seemed really invested. Um, again, I think that's like a testament to the Frick really um, being interested in emerging technologies and expanding the work that we do. Um, the collaborative nature and especially the help with record creation and uh, developing the user guides is really valuable. And I think um, that sort of collaboration and back and forth between those who are actually performing the record creation and the person who created the user guides is really helpful because what might have appeared intuitive to me was not necessarily intuitive to everybody else. Um, I will say that we did have difficulty in uh, all of the record creation in that we had a fairly tremendous staff cut in the middle of this project. Um, of the 14 staff members who were trained in record creation, um, only six were still involved by the end of the grant. Um, four of them were part-time uh, employees who had left during the course of the grant and the rest were either laid off or retired, which made it difficult to sort of achieve our initial goals, but also uh, made it really difficult for us to perform that original cataloging in BibBrain that we had hoped to perform. Um, that being said, we did create nearly a thousand records over a seven month period, which I think is fairly substantial given the, um, the number of members that we had who were working on it and how quickly they were able to adjust. Um, so yeah, so thanks. Um, I've included my email address if anybody has more questions beyond those that I can answer now. And I also wanted to thank the LD4 conference for being so nimble and getting this conference to be set up virtually. I think it's really fantastic. Yeah, is there any questions? Yeah. Sure, yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you, Mary, for this very good presentation because uh, UC Davis is also part of LD4P and we try to do similar things, but we were not as organized. And I think the, the production is definitely really impressive uh, from your institution. So very great job. Uh, so, so far we have already got some uh, information, uh, some questions for you. So uh, some questions are from Jesse. So the first question is that, uh, are you having good conversation at Freak about RDA specifically in Synopia? And so if so, how are you bringing in the RDA conversation specifically in the light of RDA, you know, the 3R project becoming the new standard tool and looking for conversations that point to something non-mark oriented in metadata and standards maintenance ongoing? Yeah, so I mean, when we were transforming, you know, a lot of our profiles were truly a, a, almost like a one to one of, um, especially with like something as sort of simple as monographs um, from our mark records to the big frame profile. And I will say that there's obviously a lot of RDA components. Um, I believe that was one of the early questions that showed up on the notes um, document that was left. Um, it's an ongoing conversation. That being said, those who were most actively involved in that process at the Frick have uh, since all retired. So we have no um, catalogers on staff currently. Um, so that's an aspect of BibFrame that I'm very interested in pursuing, but we'll have to sort of like get myself caught up before I can speak to it any more fully than that. Sure. Okay. So again, another question from Jesse. Uh, were you statistic, uh, were statistic produced manually or did you find a way to use the admin metadata programmatically? So how do you get your statistics? <laughs> so or, the, yeah. all of our stats were generated by people entering the information um, in that documentation page, largely just because it was the, it also created a space for people to um, like sort of temporarily park the record while they were working on it. One of our big fears um, was that sometimes there would be a bug in the Sanofi record and you have to reload times um, if the computer were left at rest for any period of time and you went to go work on something else related to your job, um, the page might reload. And so to ensure that um, records were saved um, and we didn't lose any of the records you're working on, we encouraged our staff to save as much as possible. And when you save, it keeps the same URL. So we encourage them to save early on in the record creation process, put the URL in that documentation page, and then refer back to it to reopen and re-edit. 
Um, so because people were using it in that way, it just made sense to sort of keep it as the main source of documentation. Um, so we didn't do anything related to the metadata necessarily. It was sort of more of a manual process. And that's sort of in a way why I feel like we're a bit different from some of the larger institutions that were participating in this grant, because I do feel like while processes like that could definitely be automated and um, sort of streamlined, we did a lot of things such as profile, um, the user guide creation and stuff that everything was done in like sort of a very manual hands-on way. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you. And uh, the funny, uh, the interesting thing is that a couple of uh, attendees to say that, um, can you share your documentation somewhere? And I'm, I'm one of those people too, so it's like, well, because your documentation is very thorough and very detailed, would you con be considering like uh, make them accessible publicly some, in some way? Yeah, so I'm happy after this to share the, um, like the Google Drive link to the documentation to the user guides. Um, I'll put that in the chat so that it's accessible here. I will also add that um, you mentioned at the beginning, TJ, that um, I'm one of the co-chairs for this PCC task group. Mm -hmm. And that task group is charged with um, going through all of the, surveying the cohort members to find out about um, sort of their own methodology for this practice in order to expand it to non LD4P cohort members. So the sort of best practices and lessons learned, the documentation we found helpful, external documentation we found helpful, um, and all of that is currently being compiled. Uh, the PCC will be the ones who can sort of control that report, but I assume that it'll be shared to the larger audience because the intent is to provide uh, libraries that currently don't use Bibframe and don't use Sanofia on how to best use it. So um, I'm happy to share my documentation, but also like stay tuned um, I would say in like early fall for increased information from the PCC about it. I don't want to speak for them, but that's what we're working on. <laughs> I, I don't, well, otherwise, we, uh, this session is recorded. We might just go after you. It doesn't happen before. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, thank you. That's <laughs> we'll fantastic. We are looking forward to the PCC report. Uh, okay, so the next question is that, uh, can you talk uh, more about how trained the catalogers had a harder time being trained on big friends? A method you use to help make sense and make the switch in your co colleagues' brands. So it's the helping the trend catalog transition from Mark cataloging to the big friend cataloging. Yeah, it was really challenging because people, especially if you perform original cataloging, they're, it's you know a very set procedure and the verbiage is really different. Um, the one thing that I found most helpful was just like sort of constantly referring to the user guides. So when, when we did that training, in addition to having access to it online, I also had printed copies for everybody. And some of our catalogers really seemed to prefer having like the printed um, copy next to them because it lists every single property in order of in within each profile. And so it was sometimes easier to sort of just think of it as like a step-by-step -step process that was totally distinct from mark record creation. Um, and there were a lot, there were like lots of um, sort of extended discussions, especially about the publishing information the, that is parsed out into different fields in BibFrame, but obviously listed in one string um, in mark. And so understanding the differences between um, a mark record and the way that a mark record displays and a bib frame record and a way and the way that um that it displays on the back end uh occasionally if people were really confused i would actually show them the back end of a bib frame record to show them how the information is displayed and how each property is is sort of parsed out into an individual triple and that you need distinct information as part of each triple um rather than a whole bunch of information conveyed in that one line. And so that seemed to be sort of helpful, but a lot of it was just sort of repetition of data entry and um, practice with the profiles, which is why it was really helpful to have uh, everyone sit around and watch one another enter the information in a profile together um, to sort of, and I think also because it was an entirely separate software from the cataloging that we normally do, um, that sort of helped separate it, but it was difficult for people to sort of detach themselves from Mark temporarily during their day. Yeah, yeah, sure. Okay, so next question is, uh, how do you do the management of the profile? Is it a process or something you do alone other tasks? 
So the profile creation was um, sort of a group effort. I mentioned Ryan Mendenhall. He helped us a bit. Rebecca Gunther helped us as well. And then um, with some of the people um, who are going to be performing the record creation, they had input in um, the profile creation itself. Uh, just in terms of, it was just nice to have people who could think differently or more abstractly about some of it. That's how um, we came to the conclusion about adding the event template. Um, that that was something that we knew we needed to somehow incorporate the exhibition history that was tied to an exhibition catalog, but how, and so adding this event um, was sort of like a bit of thinking outside the box for profile creation. And then when it came to managing the profiles itself, that was something that I did. So I sort of acted as the conduit from all the people who were performing record creation at the Frick. Um, if they had any questions or concerns or problems with the profile, if they came to me, I would go into the back end of Sanofia and um, try to fix it. And then if something were unfixable, then I would go to the Slack channel or one of the affinity groups and ask for their advice or their help. Um, in that way, it kept everything fairly controlled. And also that gave me a sense of what was working and what, what wasn't. Um, throughout the entire process. So it allowed me when we do our institutional documentation to sort of speak more to the issues that we came against and um, and how we plan to handle it or what we think needs to be improved or what we needed to improve. Um, yeah, so I sort of acted as the conduit for all of the profile maintenance. And the topic of maintaining your profiles is actually one of the issues that will be addressed in the third phase of the grant. Um, so the best practices and maintenance of those profiles is definitely something that everybody is thinking about. Sure, thanks. Okay, so there's the next question is that, are any records created in this project viewable in your regular OPEC? Uh, they are viewable as MARC records, but our um, OPEC does not connect to BibFrame. So um, <laughs> that is like a whole interesting discussion about how to actually incorporate your bid frame records into your cataloging. Um, but for now, they're not, they are viewable in, um, in Sinopia and all of our profiles are also viewable in Sinopia. They all have Frick in the name. So if you have an account in Sinopia or you make an account in Sinopia, you can look at our profiles. Um, if you type Frick in the search bar, all of our profiles will come up and they're parsed out into work instance and item. We actually did, um, unnested profiles, um, which is also another source of contention for nested versus unnested, but we found, um, I'm sorry, we use nested profiles and we found that to be easier because that way if somebody working on the work were automatically fed into the instance, automatically fed into the item for data entry. Um, but uh, I don't know if you can actually search for our records that we created in BibFrame in Sinopia. I suppose if you searched by like a title and saw that we had done an edit, then you would be able to view it. Um, but no, they're currently not displayed on the front end of any, any OPEC. Okay, cool, thanks. So the next question is that if a bunch of people just like, yeah, I love this question too. Uh, <laughs> can you share a link to, uh, to figure out bit frame records in the freak art reference library catalog? Well, I'm sorry, so, so there's no, we cannot see in the catalog at this point. But if people are interested to see the records, they definitely should use Sinopia editor. Yes. And, and but, those, you yeah. can, anybody can make an account um, in Sinopia. Mm -hmm. And if you want to show these links to the user guide, you can use our user guide to create your own account. Um, but yeah, so you should be able to see our profiles, but not the individual records. All of the records that every institution is creating in Sinopia is going into a sandbox together. Um, one of the aspects of this project was to use Blacklight, which is a service that we don't use, um, to create a discovery layer that would work with you know, um, good frame records. Mm -hmm. cool. Thanks. Okay, so the next question is that, what would you do differently if you had to do this again? Interesting. Um, I think the training at the Frick was really successful. Um, I think people became more used to it and more comfortable with the terminology than I expected and the help of a lot of the people in terms of the collaborative aspect of it was really great. Um, the one thing that I find sort of challenging about the project overall is that every participating institution sort of made their own tweak on um, an original 
profile. So we did have affinity groups and working groups. And for example, the rare materials affinity group created a profile to describe rare materials. And it was a joint effort. It is like a complete record and it can sort of be used to describe rare materials. Um, but like I said, the Frick, we created five distinct profiles that um, were in reference only to our own holdings. So in terms of how we described records on the item level, any sort of institutional information that was all included. And I think looking back, if the cohorts had worked together to create um, sort of base profiles with like a lot of pro properties in it that could be used to describe any institution's information, then future profile maintenance would be a lot easier because we would have fewer profiles and everyone would be working from sort of group profiles as opposed to their individual ones. Because what we have made at the Frick, I mean, not a lot of institutions want to describe artist file names and not a lot of institutions want to describe web archives, but um, we did. And so we created profiles to describe that material. Cool. Thanks. All right. So the next question is Robert. Well, thank you for your presentation. My question is around uh, navigation and the learning curve of working within Synopia. What was your group's experience with overall Synopia page navigation within each page for the work instance item admin metadata forms and the between tabs for each of these forms within Synopia? So what was their Synopia search experience like? What overall navigating improvements were suggested by your team? How obvious was it to translate between Mark fields and Synopia fields? So, so, yeah. um, so one of the things with Synopia was that um, the channels that our catalogers or our users um, used were quite narrow. So like the user guide and each of the user guides for the for Synopia and then also for the profiles gave a pretty direct path of how to navigate Synopia. So there wasn't a whole lot of like searching around freely. It, you know, they would mm -hmm. open Synopia, log into their account, search for the profile they wanted to use and open that profile. And then if they wanted to recall it, the process of searching in Synopia for their record was sort of all delineated in the user guide. So there wasn't a whole lot of like, I mean, anybody is obviously welcome to look around, but in terms of actual record creation, there wasn't a whole lot of, um, it was sort of very directed. Um, and like I said, we used nested profiles as opposed to the unnested profiles. So there actually wasn't any navigation between open tabs at the top of Synopia. Synopia now, if you use it and you open more than one profile or more than one um, resource template, they open as separate tabs and you have to click mm -hmm. between them. And because we would have, for example, um, someone start with the monograph profile work, they would enter all the, fill in all the properties in the work. And then at the end it says, has instance, and they'd expand that and it would have all of the instance information. And then it would send, say at the bottom of that, you know, has item and it would expand all of the item information. So it was all housed in one page. So there wasn't any sort of toggling back and forth between tabs unless they were creating more than one profile or completing more than one record at once. Um, mm -hmm. And then for the difference between um, Mark and BibFrame, like I said, one of the things that was very helpful but probably not kosher was to, um, to include all of to include when describing some of the properties in the user guide to refer to the Mark record, the Mark field that was sort of the sister to that, that bib frame property. And that just made it easier, you know, like, oh, this is from the 506, take this information from the 300, this is from the 655. That sort of, it made it easier for our users. That being said, it did create sort of a stronger tie between cataloging and mark and record creation and bib frame, but it was just sort of helpful for users. Mm -hmm. I hope that answered all of that. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. No, uh, one, so one of the questions is really about a Synopia search experience, you know, when you want to search a record, the box is, you know, there's just one box for you to search. So, so how's your uh, staff experience using that search functionality? It was generally pretty good. Um, sometimes people wouldn't have records pop up and that was often because um, the, if you copied the link, when you saved a Synopia record, when you copy the link, you can just copy it like to the clipboard and then paste it into our documentation. 
Um, but if you just actually highlighted and copied it, often it would include the carrots that were on either side of the link. Mm. And then people would try to paste that link with the carrots included back into the search function in Sonopia. And then obviously their record wouldn't come back. Um, most often people would search to reopen a record, they would search using the URI. Um, but often mm. if they didn't want to do that, they could search by um, the title of whatever material it was that they were working on because that was a mandatory field in the, the BibFrame record. And so that would automatically come up as a search field um, in Sonopia. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right. So we're down to the, the one last question. Mm -hmm. uh, so what existing ontologies did you use to describe events? And the other question is that, did you create a new terms to do this, the event part? Uh, we didn't. There is a pretty extensive use of event, and that was actually, I believe, established largely with Columbia's work with ArtFrame. Um, so if you go through the the frame ontology, there is um, an event uh, property. And then underneath that, it included information like um, the date and the auction. We used like for the auction house or the museum that was the, the host or the exhibitor, um, the curatorial staff information was included. And again, that was sort of similar to a, um, a creator element. And yeah, all of it was purely taken from the existing big frame ontology. It's just, it's one of those things that's sort of like ever expanding and you can, there are obviously rules for using it, but there are parts of it that you wouldn't sort of think are there, but then the big frame event wasn't existing, um, an existing mm -hmm. event. Yeah. I would say a lot of, cool. one thing that's worth noting with um, profile creation is that um, while we did parse out all of the different um, mark fields and with that spreadsheet that we created that's all sort of color coded, um, there was a base LD for monograph mm -hmm. profile. And so a lot of our elements were taken from that so that we didn't have to create a resource template from scratch every time. Um, and it also included all of the correct links to the lookups to LC and to genre form terms and stuff like that. So, um, so we did use the base LD4 monograph profile as like a template for our own, but then obviously we expanded it with some of the fields that we wanted to use that were institution specific. And I think a lot of mm -hmm. institutions did that. And then um, it was just sort of up to making sure that um, that profile had up to date templates that it pointed to um, and that your mm -hmm. profile pointed to the correct templates as well. I know like it's like yeah. a little bit in the weeds, but, um, and I didn't show it on here, but that's, one of the things we didn't build every profile exactly from scratch. We would often use elements from one to, to fill in parts of another one we created them. Yeah, yeah, that's definitely the, the easier way and faster way to kind of yeah. do the work rather than kind of reproduce again and again because the, the profile can be very complicated. <laughs> so you, if, you, if you have to recreate every single time, it's just too time consuming. Okay, so the next question is that uh, how how do you use open link data for authority, da uh, authority data management using Synopia? Are you linked with ISNI via? So I think maybe the most interesting question is more like, uh, in addition to that, the bunch of tools, the lookup tool has been linked in Synopia, like, uh, you know, LCSH or LDNAF. Uh, do you add additional kind of authority or lookup tool source? Um, we sort of relied on what was pre-existing. So in the profiles, there are, um, in the profiles, you can select which resource templates or sort of which resources you want to look up against. And so some mm -hmm. are sort of expected um, that, you know, there are mark related terms for describing the contributor and their role, um, the names for like a creator, obviously look up against the name authority file. Um, you can also select for additional resources to be searched against. So, um, and that was one of the updates that was made to Sinopia during this uh, second phase was that you could toggle between including all of those potential search um, authorities to search against, or you could only select some of them or select none of them. So for example, if you wanted to look up against, you know, LCNAF and also VF and ISNI, then you could select those three to look up against mm -hmm or you could toggle a couple of them off if you didn't want all of those search results. 
Um, that being said, that creating the links to those authorities was a large part of this grant. And there were people um, who were like specifically working on creating those connections. And so there was a process of incorporating them. So those um, that were deemed sort of most important or that most institutions would be using were incorporated first. And there are several that still haven't quite been added yet that um, are sort of smaller ones. Like when, you know, the list of potential um, authorities and vocabularies and stuff is quite long. Uh, you know, we referred to stuff <laughs> that was in RBMS or maybe, you know, one of the big ones for us was um, at the end was sort of pointing towards Wikidata. And so um, mm -hmm. that was something that was sort of, you know, added throughout the grant. And then you can always go back into the profile and update where the profile looks, the properties search against. So if you wanted to add, mm -hmm. for example, Wikidata, you could add that to one of the properties. Yeah, cool. Thank you. Uh, that's the, all the questions we have at this moment. Uh, so I'm going to give people 15 seconds, just in case they want to be more questions or comments to Mary. And I'm going to post I'm gonna... right now the link yeah. um, in there is the link to view all of our user guides. So feel free to take a look at anybody who wants to, to take a look. Awesome. Thank you.